Hello and welcome to today's PIR live event webinar brought to you by Partners in Research Canada. My name is Stacey Joyce and I will be your host. Remember that you can send in your questions to us through the chat function anytime throughout the presentation or the Q&A section. Don't forget to let us know where you're joining from, perhaps what grade your students are or even the student's name who asked the question. We would love to give you a shout out. And when you do send us that, we want all of our viewers to be able to see who's asking what. So please uh, make sure that you select everyone in the to field when you send your questions through the chat function. Today, our guest is Professor Tracy Snodden. She is from the Department of Economics at the Lazaridis School of Business and Economics at Wilfrid Laurier University. Thank you so much for joining us. I will let you take it away. Okay, thanks, Stacey. And, and thanks to all of you that are out there listening and have joined us. Um, Stacey's asked me to talk about carbon pricing today. Um, so I'm going to do that really shortly. Um, I'll just tell you a tiny bit about me, and if you have any questions about what I do or careers or that sort of thing, I can talk about those in the Q&A. I'm a public economist, which means that I research issues relating to government spending and government taxes. So that's really related to carbon pricing because carbon pricing is a form of government intervention in the economy. So that's all I'm going to say about me, and I'm going to launch my presentation now. So I'm going to hopefully this will go really smoothly. Here it is. And there. Oops. So we'll go back. So um, I assume we're up and running. We are indeed. Excellent. So I'm going to talk about carbon pricing um, today, and I'm going to try to keep it, give you just a high level uh, discussion about what carbon pricing is and what it's meant to do and, and how it works a little bit and why it's appealing um, from a policy perspective. So before I start talking about carbon pricing, I'd like to talk a little bit about the policy problem that carbon pricing is meant to address. So probably many of you are familiar with the problem of global warming and climate change. So the main issue is that the burning of fossil fuels like gasoline, coal, oil, uh, when you burn these fossil fuels to produce energy, we also release greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And these gases uh, trap heat in around the Earth's uh, surface and it causes the average global temperature to start to rise and this contributes to all the problems associated with global warming and climate change. So from a policy perspective, one of our main objectives is to implement policies such that greenhouse gases will be reduced or emissions of greenhouse gases will be reduced. So carbon pricing is a type of policy that governments can use to encourage reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. So I have a little picture on my screen here meant to convey emitters emitting greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. Greenhouse gas emissions include carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and some other stuff. If, if we don't have any specific policies in place, there's actually no cost to having releasing those emissions into the atmosphere. And so um, the problem is we need to implement some policy that reduces those emissions. So carbon pricing, what it does is it makes it costly to reduce emissions. You put a charge on the emissions of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and that's an attempt to influence behavior, influence the amount of emissions that emitters and different economic activities put up into the atmosphere. So there are two types of carbon policies, carbon pricing policies that governments can use. One is a carbon tax, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And the other is a cap and trade system. And if you've been paying attention to the news lately, these um, policies have been discussed a lot in the media over the past uh, couple of months and, and indeed the past year or so. 
So a carbon tax is pretty straightforward to understand because we all encounter taxes in our everyday life. Um, if you go to the store and you buy a pair of jeans or you buy a book, the price tag on the sticker is different than the price you pay when you go to checkout because the government's imposed a tax and so the, car the tax raises the price of the good that you're buying. And the carbon tax works in the same way. It's levied on um, for each unit of emissions in greenhouse gases that get emitted, there's a, a fixed dollar amount. And so that makes it more expensive to emit greenhouse gases and hopefully induces some changes in behavior. A cap and trade system um, works differently, but essentially also results in a price on greenhouse gas emissions where they didn't exist, before, where one didn't exist before. So it starts with the government imposing a, a cap, a maximum on the allowable emissions in a given period of time, like a year. And then emitters are required to buy permits to cover each of the emissions that they put out into the atmosphere. So if you're going to emit 10 tons of, of greenhouse gases, you need 10 one-ton permits to cover off your emissions. If you don't have enough permits, like that would be like my emitter who's in my picture on the, on the far right hand side where the pink bubble is big and the emit the, the permits that the firm has is captured by the blue circle, they need more permits. So they might offer to buy some of the surplus per permits from the um, emitter beside them who has more than enough permits to cover their emissions. So that's the trading part of cap and trade. And the supply of permits is fixed and given, depending on the demand for permits, that interaction of those supply and demand forces generates a price for the permits. So both of these carbon pricing policies, what they do is they provide a financial incentive to emitters to try to reduce emissions, but it also gives emitters some flexibility. So in my picture here on the left, we have carbon um, greenhouse gases being emitted into the atmosphere, and we have some carbon pricing policy in place as represented by these dollar signs. Now some emitters will evaluate their options and say, well, I'm paying a lot in, in carbon taxes or I'm spending a lot on permits, perhaps I could reduce my emissions by changing my production technology or reducing my production or switching to a cleaner fuel. And if I do that, my emissions go down and so too do my carbon charges. So if you see, um, whoops, that means if you reduce your emissions, your carbon payments and some of those dollar signs disappear. Now some emitters will find it really expensive to reduce emissions. It's hard to uh, change the production technology, their fuel sources are limited and um, restricted in some fashion. And so with carbon pricing, whether it be a tax or a cap and trade system, those emitters for, who find it really expensive to reduce emissions, it might be a cheaper option for them to pay the tax or for them to buy permits. So these carbon pricing systems allow that flexibility, a flexibility to either pay the price or to reduce the emissions and lower the, the carbon expenditures that carbon price expenditures that you're making. It also provides emitters with the flexibility on how to reduce emissions. So they could reduce production, change their fuel, change production technology, and they have that flexibility to choose the option that works the best for them. So there are other policy options for reducing greenhouse gases and emissions of greenhouse gases. Um, I'm not going to talk about them in any, de in any detail. There's some regular regulatory approaches you can use, performance standards. The government can also subsidize clean technology development. But the appeal of carbon pricing is that it, it typically achieves emissions reductions at a lower cost than these other alternatives. So here I have my little thinking 
government official on the right hand side and when confronted with two policy options carbon pricing being one of them and an alternative policy option both of them can achieve the same reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in my example 50 tons but the carbon pricing option, the costs of reducing emissions are much lower because of the flexibility built into the system. So that's something we call cost effectiveness. Achieving this and comparing these two policies, carbon pricing is cost effective because it achieves the same emissions reduction but at a lower cost. So um, there are other considerations that the government is going to keep in mind when it thinks about implementing policies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So if it's deciding on carbon pricing, it's also going to think about what is the fairness of, associated with the particular policy in mind. And it might introduce some additional complementary measures to address the fact that carbon pricing raises prices and has an uneven effect on people of low income and people of high income. It also, uh, depending on which approach you adopt, has budget implications for the government. So if you adopt a carbon pricing approach with a carbon tax, basically the government gets the carbon tax revenues. If you adopt a cap and trade system and the government sells the permits, then the government's also getting some carbon tax revenues, uh, carbon permit revenues, and the governments then can do something with those revenues. It can take those revenues and invest it in clean technology development, or it can take those revenues and reduce um, other taxes that we pay, say sales taxes. Um, so those are a consideration. We want policies to be relatively straightforward to implement and a carbon tax and cap and trade can be relatively straightforward policies to implement. Um, my picture over here on the, on the right hand side is showing a complicated policy. So complicated policies are hard to administer, they, they suck up costs and so they just add on to the ex, extra work and extra costs associated with implementing policies to achieve goals. So we want to keep our policies relatively simple to administer. So that's another consideration governments would take into account. And finally, um, another uh, objective when we think about implementing policy is how the policy affects our competitiveness. Our competitiveness. So if you think about Canada exports, goods and services around the world and, and a lot to the United States. And carbon pricing will increase the price of goods. And if other countries aren't doing something similar, then our, the price of our exports go up and it makes our goods less competitive in the international market. So that's also something that governments will, will take into account. So that's my description of carbon pricing in a nutshell. And I'm gonna leave you with one um, final slide, which is just to give you a sense of what carbon pricing looks like in Canada right now um, and where we're headed in the next few years. So provinces, some provinces have already implemented some carbon pricing policies. Quebec, the province of Quebec has a cap and trade or emissions trading system and Ontario is going to have its own cap and trade system very soon, starting in January. Some Western provinces like British Columbia and Alberta, they have carbon tax systems. And you'll notice that not all provinces have, carbon, have adopted carbon pricing. Very recently, last month, the federal government announced a new carbon pricing plan that was basically going to try to extend carbon pricing to ensure that all provinces had some form of carbon pricing operating, um, which would allow us to achieve greater greenhouse gas emission reductions and keep the costs of doing that low. Okay, thank you. Now, oh, thank you very much. Perfect. So 
I, I have our first question here from Mr. Ongley's grade nine class in Waterdown, Ontario. And they would, they're concerned, won't this bankrupt the businesses that need carbon to run? Okay, well, that's a good question. So we, you know, one of our criteria when we think about implementing policies is, you know, is it going to have a, a really um, significant cost on business and drive them out of business? And so that's legitimate. So governments handle that in different ways. So in cap and trade systems, what they do is for a period of transition, they will give certain industries or certain economic sectors, firms in those industries, they'll give them the permits for free. So they have an allotment of permits, they don't have to buy most of them. And so then it's just a question of if they've exceeded their number of permits a little bit in terms of emissions, they might only have to buy a few. And um, if they've managed to reduce emissions a little bit, they'll have a few surplus um, permits that they can sell. So by giving permits away for free over a short period of time, it can help businesses adjust. And um, carbon taxes, you can do the same sort of thing. You can exempt certain sectors for a period of time to allow them to slowly uh, adjust to the new, you know, low carbon, carbon pricing world. Uh, okay, so there's even more flexibility in there then in, in how it's implemented. Yeah. Um, well, Ms. McPherson's class in middle, at Middlefield Collegiate in Markham, Ontario, would like to know when carbon pricing was first introduced. And I would love to know, if you happen to know, where in the world that was. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think it was the European Union. The European Union was the first um, big scale uh, emissions trading system. And I think they started in 2005. There might have been some smaller carbon taxes introduced um, in places like Norway and maybe some of the other Scandinavian countries in early 1990s. But the biggest um, sort of a big broad scale um, carbon pricing happened with the EU, although selected other countries have introduced it earlier. Okay. Oh, I know if I might just add that in Canada, um, British Columbia and Quebec were the first to introduce carbon pricing policies starting and, and Alberta starting around 2007, 2008. And I noticed in your map, one of your last slides there, you had those uh, rates of carbon tax listed. What drives that rate? There was quite a difference between Quebec and British Columbia, for example. So um, the key difference uh, between a carbon tax and a cap and trade, with a carbon tax, the government sets the, the price. So BC has set its carbon tax at $30 a ton. And originally it started at $10 a ton and it, it, it rose over time and it's been at $30 for the past four years. In a cap and trade system, you, you set, you fix the level of emissions. So rather than fixing the price, you fix the quantity of emissions. And then because the supply of permits is fixed, the supply and demand of, of for permits by emitters um, drives what the permit price will be. Now Quebec's system, cap and trade system, is linked with California's Quebec, uh, California's cap and trade system. And so the pool of emitters covered by permit trading is bigger. And basically um, California has some low low emission reduction cost opportunities so it that's helped to keep the permit price low so um, the way the permit the carbon prices are determined is different under the two systems and um, in an ideal world from an economics perspective you would like the carbon price to be the same um, that way you ensure the most cost effective emissions reductions are undertaken when carbon prices differ in different regions, then you might be encouraging 
emissions reductions that are expensive when they could be done cheaper someplace else, but there's, a, there's no carbon price there. I see. Um, so Mrs. McConnell's grade five, six class in North Haven would like to know how will carbon pricing affect Alberta's main industry, oil and gas? Yes, that's a very good question because oil and gas um, is very energy intensive to produce it. Um, and if we think about Canada's greenhouse gas emissions as a whole, the province of Alberta or the, the oil and gas sector accounts for about 26% of all Canada's emissions. So it's very emissions intensive. So Alberta has adopted um, a slightly different approach. It has a, a broad-based carbon tax um, and it's, so it, it's fixing the price and then it intends to take the revenues from the carbon tax and use it partly to help its industries adjust over time. That makes a lot of sense. That would ease the burden, I yeah. suppose, on those businesses by reinvesting in them. Um, so uh, Ms. McPherson's class in Markham, Ontario, would like to know if greenhouse gases are causing global warming, why isn't the media giving attention and supporting the cause to reduce greenhouse gases? That's a very good question and tricky, tricky question too. Um, the, the media, if you pay attention to the media, you'll notice that um, on the one hand, there'll be lots of articles supporting uh, carbon pricing initiatives and tackling greenhouse gas emissions. And on the other, there are some, some skeptics. And some of the skeptics, um, or the reason they're not giving so much attention to it, is that climate change is a global problem. Greenhouse gases, in fact, it doesn't matter where you reduce the greenhouse gases. If we were to reduce greenhouse gases in Canada or do the same greenhouse gas reductions in China, the impact on the environment um, in terms of global warming is the same. So it's possible that if you reduce emissions over here, you increase emissions someplace else. So because it's a global, ex a global problem and Canada's share of emissions is quite small, um, some people are skeptical that if Canada embarks, acts on its own to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, that it won't really have any big effect. And so people are mixed on that, on that uh, point of view. So I think in, on the one hand, Canada is trying to be a leader in showing that it's going to tackle greenhouse gases and hopefully other countries will come on board. The European Union already is, is doing the same and there's pockets of carbon price initiatives around the world. Well, that, um, that brings me to another question we have from Ms. McPherson's class in Markham, Ontario. And they would like to know if all countries have to pay a carbon tax, and if not, why? Good question. So, like I said, um, climate change and global warming affects the whole Earth. Um, but there is, so it's a global problem. But we don't have a global government. We have individual governments and individual countries. And those individual governments can only really control what they do in their own country. Sometimes countries get together and they have international agreements to do certain things to reduce, try to reduce greenhouse gases and so on. Um, but basically government policies are going to be specific to their um, country because we don't have a global government. So last a year ago, Canada went to um, what's called the Paris Summit climate meetings to discuss what you know the global community community could do to reduce greenhouse gases and various countries committed at that meeting to, to take action to try to keep their emissions low or reduce emissions to achieve a certain temperature target. So okay. they, they agree to cooperate, but we can't force any other countries to do what we want them to do. Right. 
So uh, keeping in that global context, and I suppose uh, sort of testing your international economics knowledge, um, Ms. Tipsharani's class near Ottawa, Ontario would like to know, um, how would carbon tax take a toll on inflation for a lot of countries? And would it turn countries' inflation to a similar level as Venezuela? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, that's a hard question. <laughs> and I'm not sure I know the answer just off the top of my head. Certainly, carbon pricing will cause um, prices of goods and services, some goods and services to go up, but it's not going to be general inflation. When we have general inf inflation, it means all prices are rising. So the prices of goods um, that, are, that rely on fossil fuel energy to be produced, those prices are gonna go up. And, and, and uh, the goods that rely mainly on clean energy sources like hydro and wind and solar, those prices of those goods that are relying on that type of energy may not go up as much. So relative, what we call relative prices, prices of energy intensive goods will go up, but goods that are not energy, as energy intensive, their prices you know, could remain fixed or even fall. So we're not gonna see general inflation per se, um, we'll see different prices of different goods changing depending on how energy intensive they are. That makes sense. So those um, prices on carbon then, they do end up uh, trickling down into the marketplace uh, mm -hmm. one way or another. Interesting. Yeah. So uh, Ms. McPherson's class is apparently also with Ms. Hunter Ms. Lawrence and Ms. Sui's class, two science and math classes, and they have come up with this question. Is there a limit to greenhouse gas emissions for a country? If yes, is there a penalty in terms of money? So perhaps was something like that an outcome of the, um, the talks in Paris? Well, the talks in Paris, governments um, voluntarily commit to do something. And if they don't do it, there's, there's no penalty. So um, that's sort of a, a simple answer. Um, but if Canada has, I mean, Canada has committed to reduce its emissions um, by a certain amount by 2030. So it really, I think, under the new um, Liberal government really is interested in, in hitting that emissions reduc reduction target. If Canada doesn't hit it, there's no financial penalty from other countries from it not meeting that target, but it does affect its, its um, international profile and how the country is viewed by other countries around the world that are, are taking um, serious steps to reduce emissions. So politically, it makes it's important. Right. So Ms. Mrs. McConnell's grade five, six class in North Haven would like to know when all is said and done, we've got these different prices uh, for carbon in different provinces. So even just within Canada, uh, is it possible that Albertans will end up paying more for carbon taxes than other citizens in other provinces? Um, so the, there's, there's two sides to, to that question. So the, the, I talked about cost effectiveness. So you want to implement policies that allow emissions reductions. You know, if you have a choice to do it in an expensive way and a choice to reduce emissions in a cheaper way, cost effectiveness says we would like to do it as cheaply as possible because that leaves us more money to do other things. However, the fairness issue is that carbon pricing the effects of carbon pricing are uneven. They'll be uneven across individual families and they'll be uneven across the provinces as well. So currently there's two ways, um, the Alberta, two ways to handle that. The Alberta government itself is taking its carbon pricing revenues and it's using those revenues and intends to use those revenues not only to help industries adjust, but also to help um, 
households that are more reliant on electricity and then suffer from higher prices to to give them money back so that they are not not hurt as much from a canada-wide perspective the federal government can step in and help redistribute income across uh, individuals and across provinces to help balance out those effects the question is it hasn't quite reached that stage yet in terms of whether it's specifically going to do something to reallocate the burden across um, provinces um, so we're waiting to see whether that's the next step for the federal government very interesting i think we are we're talking about this um you know as it's developing so it will be interesting to see how things change over the next several years um, so we we are just about out of time here i'd like to ask one more question or one more set of questions um, we've got one more question from our collective of uh, two science and math classes uh, why are you interested in this topic and what got you interested in studying this type of economics so um, my interest in public sector economics has to do with government activities as i said and a particular challenge when we think about government spending and government taxes is when you have more than one level of government implementing policy so this is this happens a lot in canada um, in something in federal systems where we have multiple levels of government doing things simultaneously so provinces implement sales taxes and income taxes and carbon pricing and when they do that um, sometimes those policies conflict from a national point of view and then the federal government comes along and it also implements income taxes and and it could implement its own carbon price if it wanted and those policies can be complementary or they can conflict and so that's interesting to see my interest was how can we design policies to minimize some of those conflicts to the for the benefit of the whole economy so economic problem solving then economic problem solving where there's multiple governments doing multiple things so that's it sounds it sounds very intricate <laughs> i'm sure we could talk at length about all of these topics but we have run out of time i wanted to thank everyone for joining us today especially professor snodden thank you so much for your time and sharing your expertise with us it was an excellent excellent questions from from all of you people out there thanks for joining us indeed Next week on PIR live event, we are talking about HIV vaccine research on World AIDS Day. For more information about that webinar and other upcoming webinars, you can visit PIRweb.org. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.